I got fired based off of corporate politics. It was more so not knowing how to navigate through corporate America. I was by myself and I was really depressed and that really took a toll on my mental health. And I would show up doing the bare minimum. Like, you know, I would just do my job and go home. My managers just started to uh, okay. yeah, just take note on things that was going on. She was like, you know, work starts at eight o'clock. So at eight o'clock, you don't need to be work walking in the door at eight o'clock swiping your badge. You need to be at your desk. That's counting. a little micromanagement stuff. Yeah. Like that. I hate that. Yeah. And so when she put me on the PIP, I'm I'm just thinking, oh, okay, well, I'll just do, you know, what it takes, what she's telling me to get off the PIP. I'm just going to do it because I'm like, I'm a good worker. I, I'll just do all the stuff that she's telling me to do and I'm going to get off the PIP the first week of December. Your badge don't work. <laughs> no. Last week, it was Monday, right? You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing well, thinking, excited. That meeting from HR get put on my, <laughs> that four o'clock meeting. And they're like, yeah, um, Terry, you're going to have to, this is going to be your last day. This video is being brought to you by Level Up in Tech. Even if you have no experience in cloud and computing, Level Up in Tech is here to help you get into the cloud. Now, you may be asking yourself, why should I get in the cloud? Well, let me show you. So, a cloud computing engineer can make anywhere from $80,000 to $200,000 per year. While cloud computing will create almost a million new job demand for certain skills, one recent study predicted that there will be over 220,000 open cloud computing positions by 2025. Love Open Tech has a six step process to guarantee your success. Here are some reasons why you should choose Love Open Tech. And here are some of the things you will learn. You'll learn about server config and troubleshooting, the AWS cloud, infrastructure as code, scripting, containerization, and much, much more. You can check out many of their testimonials on their website and they post testimonials on LinkedIn as well. Here's where some of the former students of Level of Tech work at and articles you can see them in and hear their coaches. If you're ready to get your cloud career started, click the link in my bio to learn more about Level Open Tech. That's why Loki, I be wanting to start like a, I don't know, it don't even have to be niche, but just the podcast, like different stuff. Cause like you say, music is really meant to bring back feelings from certain times you yeah. listen to it. So just different stuff you liked at the time. Like for me, mm-hmm. I just thought about like how fun it was. Yo, Pierre, you want to come here? Yeah. And then yeah. that Magnolia come out. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, that's the same. Yeah, like all the Magnolia. Uh, if I hit it one, mm, she mm-hmm. gonna, mm, that one. Uh, what else did Cardi drop that that year? Was that Bodak? No, that was twenty seventeen. Motorsport. Uh, that was Megan. That's when really Megan popped off. I thought it was like the, I think I thought Megan really popped off like twenty nineteen. Cause I ain't gonna lie, uh, workout, workout. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Wale just fell off. Wale. I want to see him a big shine. I saw Wale. I went to Dreamville, twenty twenty two. Mm-hmm. He was late. He, he, I was, I was very. He probably was going through some things. <clears throat> probably. Let me see what it is. Okay, cool. I got this. Let me go ahead and intro the pod. Yeah. Yo, welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. Well, I'm your host HD. This is episode, what is it, 117? Yeah, episode 117. And uh, if you're watching with us right now on YouTube, you know what to do. Hit the subscribe button. Hit like. Select all to be notified of all notifications. And listening on podcasts, streaming networks everywhere, leave us a review. Follow the podcast. Share it out to people that want to hear this information. Today, y'all in for a treat. People on Patreon have been watching like the whole version where we really just been having a, a fun time, laid back conversation. But... Today we are here with Miss Terry Evans, and we're gonna talk about technical program management and why people just excuse my no, nah, I'm just gonna, I'm I'm playing <laughs> why people got her messed up. That's what we're gonna talk about. <laughs> so, um, Terry, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. It's a little bad weather out here today. Well, okay. it's gloomy, but this is really a lazy day. Mm-hmm. I think that's the reason why we took so long to start. I had to get our energy up. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, I had to. But how's your your 2024 been so far? It's been. You know, it's a, it's been interesting, I would say that. Um, not the way I wanted it to start off, but I would say that it's going to progress this year. Okay. I, I, I have hope that it's going to be a good year. But the way that it started, January was a trial month. So, um, you know, I was trying to figure it out. But February, looking a little bit more optimistic. Got some things coming up. So I'm very optimistic for what this year is going to be. Okay, cool. And for our listeners and guests that who don't know who you are, who are you? Sure. Or look, look, 
It's like an interview. Uh, oh, so can you tell me about yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Terry Evans. I am from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Shout out to J. Cole. I currently live in Dallas, Texas. I've been in the tech industry for about 12 years now. Um, I got my bachelor's from North Carolina A&T State University in management information systems. And I am currently a technical program manager at a tech company. Dope. So we definitely got to get into a lot of stuff because we want to go into from a little bit, I guess, from like high school going into yeah. college. Did you initially go major in MIS? No, I didn't. I didn't. So I originally was a political science major going into college. So originally, I always wanted to be a lawyer. And um, that was just the interest that I always wanted to go into. Um, but my tech interest, it really started when I was like 13, um, based on MySpace. So on MySpace, you know, if you were there during that time, it was really uh, website development. And from there, I really just wanted a cute layout on my space. Like I would start it off. I wanted to just design banners and was doing all that. And then I started to see like other people, you know, take the comments off their page, take their profile page. I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And I saw like in the back end, there was some code there. And I was like, okay, what does this mean? And I'm like, I started to like play around with it. I was like, okay, this starts to, this is making a little bit more sense. Like if I put hit this here and then I really started getting deep into it. And then I taught myself HTML and CSS. And from there you would think, you know, you doing all that, you should go into tech. And my friends would be like, yeah, you're really good at this tech stuff. You should really get into it. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm trying to be a lawyer. Like, I'm I'm trying to be the next Claire Huxtable. <laughs> like, I'm trying to be a lawyer. And um, so I, that was just the interest that I went into because really just growing up, I never saw anyone in tech. The My perspective of what tech looked like was Geek Squad at Best Buy. And so I was like, I don't want to work at Best Buy, so I don't want to go into tech because what looked like success to me in the black community was being a lawyer, being a doctor. And so being those, I was like, yeah, I, to be successful, I can't do this tech thing. This is just a hobby. So, um, no, I, I don't want to do that. So I went off to college, political science major. And I want to say six to eight weeks into that major, I had an intro to a poli sci class. And I was in that class, and I was like, this is not <laughs> for me. I'm like, I... I don't have the the passion that a lot of people in this class have. Like we were come to class and people would talk about we're going to start a protest and all these <laughs> things. And I'm like, I, I don't have any interest in that. Um, um, something happened with our transit system in the city that I went to college in. And they were like, yeah, we're going to rally around them, start a protest, all that. And I'm like, I don't have any interest in this. <laughs> like, I, I, I know I don't want to do this. So I'm gonna just head on out. And what ended up happening for me, I went back to my dorm room, and I started to like, think about what I could do in life. And I remember back to orientation that I had during the summer. So freshman during like freshman orientation, when you go to college, you know, how you go to orientation. And I remember during that um, orientation, there was a advisor who um, you know, was just given one of those typical motivational um, talks to the incoming freshmen. And during that, she says, like, hey, write down my number. Take down my number. Everybody get out your phone. Write down your number. And she was like, if you need me for anything, just call me. And so this is now October. And so I'm like, okay, I remember that moment. And so I um, – you know picked up my phone and I still had her number and I called her and I was like I don't know what I want to do I don't, I'm a political science major I don't want to do this anymore but I, I don't know what I want to do and she's like all right just calm down she's like we can set up a meeting and we can you know have this conversation so I met with her and I told her like you know I don't know what I want to do um, I just don't want to be a political science major anymore so she ended up you know, letting me know she couldn't be the one that helps me but she ended up referring me to the art counseling service um, department on campus. And from there, um, I met with the counselor, we did some assessments, did a little aptitude test. And we from the that test, tech, mm -hmm. <laughs> and business were my top interests. And, you know, so we went and we she was like, Hey, you know, business tech, which one? And I was like, is there anything that merges the two? And so we looked at what the um, major catalog for a and was. And MIS was the top major um, for one that mixes IT and business. So that's how I ended up getting into it. So my freshman year, I didn't come in starting it, but I ended up um, by the middle of my first semester changing to MIS. Okay. That's 
typical college freshman story. Yeah. <laughs> I had some questions mm -hmm. that I had to let you get out because that was great. That was wonderful. Yeah. I want to ask you this to be a little funny. If we're going to go back to MySpace, mm -hmm. who you used to have is like you had your top, like you had your top four, top five. Who you used to have on there? Oh, you going to get me in trouble. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, so I really, I took, because remember I web designing at this point. So I like took all of that off. Like I did, I didn't want nobody to know. So I had like, you know, my best friends. And then like, I had like, a little boyfriend. Yeah, a little boo that was on there. And, like, you know, I grew up in the church, so, like, heavy in the church. So, I'm, you know, you had your little church boo, you had your little yeah. school boo. So, like, those, those are the people that was on my top. But, you know, they never got to see it because I was, like, I could see on that. And then one of the things I learned how to do with doing web design is I could, like, take somebody else's user ID put it on there, look through people's comments that took it off their page. Yeah. And I could see all the stuff that people didn't see what, what was going on. And so I was like um, looking at stuff. I knew what, all the stuff that was going on that people didn't even know that they had on their yeah. page. I was like sitting up there, like just being nosy. Yeah. Back then my, um, my friend Deidre, she was good at that. So I'm like, mm -hmm. yo, Hey, do my page. And so yeah. that's when you get your stuff hid and, mm -hmm. and everything. So that used to be, that, used, that would be perfect. I know back in the day, I just started having like a long one. So people would feel left yeah. out. And then it used to be like, Whoever I might have been talking to might have been one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I made the grave mistake of I was – it was freshman year. <laughs> my uh, my picture was the girl that I was talking to at the time, her uh -huh. profile, and vice versa. And my older cousin was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> I had never made yeah. that mistake after that, but that was like a lot of the trial and error. But, like, it was – you know, I loved getting – you know, you, you come – this hey, y'all, for y'all that – or millennials who dealt with this, who were like in high school at the time or whatever time you're using MySpace, you come home or maybe because really back then, iPhone maybe just been getting hot, mm -hmm. but it still wasn't how it is yeah, now. So you really have to get the full capability on the computer. So you go home, you log in, oh, new messages, new likes, yeah. new photo comments, all this different thing, new friend requests. Like I was like, oh yeah, I'm lit. Like yeah. that, that's the time. Like it was, MySpace was ahead of its time. It was, and you know, I got to the point even like how I was web designing my own. I had one of them pages that you went to and you that you went and go copy and paste and and use one of um, those templates. Web, yeah, so I I ended up creating one of those yeah. pages. I started to get paid. People um, wanted me to do banners for them, websites for them. I started doing them for my church and every, I like so I was mm -hmm. I started like doing a little something thanks to MySpace. I appreciate it, you know, for putting us on. I don't think there's nothing like that today where these kids can learn yeah. something a tech skill from that and wouldn't recognize it. So I really definitely appreciate MySpace for, you know, putting me on. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Now I want to get into you pivoting into MIS. Mm -hmm. And you say you took an aptitude test. Mm -hmm. Was that aptitude test the plan test? I'm not sure. Like, it, you know, it's been like 14 years yeah. now. <laughs> I just remember in high school we took like this plan test or whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to show you what your interests yeah. are. I think my interest was pretty much similar. Like yeah. working with your hands, doing something with technology or something else. And, um, well, actually, I think I BS the test, to be honest. You know what? And that's why I really don't like those tests, because I am very analytical. So mm -hmm. it's very easy to manipulate them tests that you can, you know, kind of calculate what they're actually looking for and what they're, what the answer will be. So I remember taking a test like that in high school where it was like, but I feel like I manipulated it to to say that I was going to be a lawyer because yeah, yeah. I wanted to be a lawyer. So I'm right. like, the questions you asking me about law, I'm I'm going to make it the highest because I know that's going to tell me that I wanted to be a lawyer. But I think with the test that I took um, with the counselor's office, it was a little bit different because I couldn't do that. I couldn't manipulate it, and I I didn't want to because I was like very passionate about. What you want to do for the right, rest of your life? Right, I'm like, I, w I need to know what I'm doing. So I was like, okay, let me not try to manipulate this to be the answers that I want. Let me just answer yeah. it the correct ways, and let's just figure it out at the end. And so that's what led it to us. I don't know distinctly what that exact test was because it's it's just been too long. But um, definitely, um, I definitely agree with you that, you know, those so, tests. So by that time, you didn't want to be Molly from <laughs> no. Insecure anymore? no. <laughs> I think because I guess that's who the girls would look up to now because they ain't yeah. watch they didn't watch the Cosby's like, girlfriends. Right. It's got to be Molly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, in school, did you do any? I guess like because I I assume that MIS and CIS are very similar. Mm -hmm. 
besides like I don't know what what I mean. I know it's a, a long time ago. What was that curriculum like for yeah. MIS? So with MIS at A and T, I don't know like if it's the same at other schools, but I would make the assumption it is. Um, MIS was a management degree mm -hmm. with a concentration in IS. So the curriculum really followed business management. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my classes were accounting, stats, econ. That was the main portion of my um, curriculum was those classes. But um, one of the great things about being an MIS major, my advisor, um, she was over an organization called AITP, which is Association of IT Professionals. And with it um, being a club, she and her being my advisor, she will always advocate for joining that club. And with it being an IT club, even though it was hosted in the business school, a lot of IT, um, you know, CIS, computer science majors will come join the club. So I had a lot of friends that would join um, the organization. And through that, having those connections with them, like I had a friend, um, I really appreciate him. He was a, he was a little bit older um, than me. I definitely have to connect you with him because he's just really great in, in the way um, my journey has been in, in tech in general. But um, being connected to him, he was a little bit older. He had went to school previously, left, came back. And he was a um, CIS major. And with that, um, he was like, you know, hey, you know, you're not going to get all the technical skills that you need being an MIS major. So he was like, you know, your electives, come take your electives over here. He's like, take this mainframe class, take this networking class. So I would take on top of so the business. So you took art classes. Yes. So I took, and then, of course, for MIS as well, just outside of that, we had, like, object-oriented programming. So, yeah. you know, I we learn SQL, we learn Python, we learn Java. So we had our programming classes. Oh, see, so you learned some good stuff. Yeah. I only – Programming language we learned was Visual Basic. <laughs> did uh, wow. did you have to take supply chain management? I did. I did. Hey, supply chain was probably one of the hardest classes I took. Really? It was interesting, though. I enjoyed we it. We had – look, the class was so hard. And I want to say – hopefully I can get uh, Jessica on here because I think I remember her dropping the class before we even took our first test. Mm. And uh, doctor, I think she was a doctor. Dr. Barreau said, if you do what I tell you to do, in this class, you're going to pass. Mm. And I think I ain't no coming out there with a B. Mm. She used to tell us all the time, hey, if you don't know the answer to a, qu a, a question on a test, just mark C. Yeah. Me and my friend Joey, we had stayed up, us and somebody else, we studied the whole mm. night. And we got to the test like, I still don't know. I'm, I'm like, I'm marking C. <laughs> I look back at him. I see him marking C, too. I'm like, I'm like, man, fool, that test was hard. I was like, man, who you tell? I ain't know nothing. Yeah. But I think we had to like, do some like group projects, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that that class was hard. Um one of the econs was really hard, too. I took three econ econs. Econ was my worst. I did one-on-one, one-on-two, and monetary economics. I really like monetary mm -hmm. economics. It, it put me on game about money. And um, my statistics class was hard, but not hard. Yeah. It's just because the professor was not American. Yeah. And so them, them, them accents will get you in a class. You can pass and fail over accent. He looks like if Dexter from Dexter's uh, Laboratory was a real person. <laughs> That's how he looks. And so he would always, like, all I remember from there is X bar. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hmm. <laughs> so he was trying to say, hmm, see if we paying attention or yeah. whatever. But that class, I mean, it was cool, but he didn't ever change the test. So mm -hmm. everybody had the test. Yeah. Like, literally. He caught a dude with the test, and he still didn't fail him. He was just like. Wow. <laughs> I had too much integrity. I wanted to learn how to do stuff. So I actually learned how yeah. to do the stuff and still messed up on the test because mm -hmm. I was just writing the wrong sign at the end of my problem. I was yeah. working it out and everything. But that's why I was like, dang, I know I know this stuff. But I think, I think that one. And, yeah, I think those might have been, like, the two hardest mm -hmm. classes. And like you said, the CIS ones was um, database, networking. I took one of my elective side and had to take was, like, a forensics class. Mm -hmm. I had a system analysis and design class. Yeah. Am I missing one? That, I uh, love systems and analysis. I honestly. That's our capstone. I, that's what I um, thought I was going to go into. That's the pathway I thought I was going to be, like, a, a system, system analyst. analyst. Yeah, Me too. That's the way I thought I was going to go. Um, but, course life happens but yeah. Yeah, that or a database analyst like because i enjoyed and you know going and that was funny yeah we used to use uh, my sequel and stuff like mm -hmm. that the funny thing is though now that i think about that system analysis and design capstone class i would say very much so would be like i would assume some of the stuff that you do now uh, a little bit a little bit because we were using um microsoft project yeah to keep up with the tasks that everybody had to do in the group i would say the, and you know i don't know how if your system analyst uh class was set up the same way but 
the things that we did in that class for me, it was more so like what I see a BA doing. So a business analyst, we're taking the requirements, building out with, or, or even a UX designer. Yeah. Those are. I think we did all that because yeah. our, our, we just pretty much was tested like building out a solution mm -hmm. and our team built out a inventory system for like the bowling shoes at the intramural. Mm -hmm. And so we had designed a little thing and then, cause pretty much it's cast on. So it kind yeah. of took everything that we always did. Mm -hmm. And of course they coded it in visual basic and presented it. I forgot what I even did. I think, <laughs> I think I might've just been like just there. <laughs> Ready and, to go. <laughs> and, and passed that and passed yeah. that. I picked like some good group mates and, mm -hmm. and we did good on ours. Yeah. It was like when they say, yo, make sure you dress up for your presentation <laughs> and all the stuff I'm talking about. I was always like, so with MIS, our major was small, like, because like I said, it was, um, it was a concentration under management. So mm -hmm. just those that were MIS majors, it was like seven of us that graduated and we were tight. Like we did everything together. We studied together those last two years. We were just like connected. So we were always like just doing stuff. I think for our system um, analyst class that we each person had to do like a, um, a product basically create a product, come up with the features mm -hmm. and requirements. And um, so each individual person, so we didn't even get a chance to do a group project and, <laughs> and do that. So I had, we had to individually um, put it together. But even with that, with us being small, like we still connected like, okay, your project is this, we're going to work on that. Then we're going to work on this. And so I really appreciate it being a, such a small major. Um, yeah. De definitely shout out to the, my people that I was working with. So did you do any internships in college? I did. I did. So um, I did two internships, if we want to call the first one an internship. It was with um, my school. So I was an IT intern for the career service office. Okay. Um, the person that I mentioned about talking to, uh, doing the mainframes classes and networking, he's the person that got me into that office. And it was really just a IT internship by name. <laughs> um, so... You know, we were supposed to be doing database analysis where we were taking, you know, the student data, um, their profiles, the things that. So I had access to people's GPAs and the classes they take. I was, let me not say that, <laughs> but, you know, I could have been um, going in and looking at people's transcripts and stuff like that. And so we were like taking that information and seeing, you know, the companies that they connected to. And, you know, because we were basically that career service office was over um, anytime there was a career fair or anytime yep. a, a a company came onto campus, um, that was where we, um, you know, connected. So it was doing some data warehousing through doing that. So that was my first internship. I had that through my junior year to senior year. But during the summer of my junior incoming senior year, I had a internship um, at this healthcare company called Cardinal Health in um, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, so that was my first internship. And I honestly, I got that internship just by determination because – um, you know, it got to my junior year and I didn't have an internship. And one of the things that they drilled at a t is like, you need to leave the school with an internship or a co-op. Like it was like, get one before you leave off this campus, like, please get an internship. And so I got to my, um, because I switched over my major, um, my summer for my freshman year, I was in summer school cause I'm trying to you catch, know, up. catch it back up. Cause maths for poli sci major is not the mass for business majors so I had to like you know switch all of that so my uh, freshman and sophomore years were concentrated on you know trying to catch back up so getting into my junior year I did not have an internship and I'm like okay I, I gotta I gotta get on the ball and so I went to the um, career fair I didn't get no internships from there <laughs> like <laughs> I didn't get nothing um, I ended up like I had an interview for USAA they flew me out to San Antonio um, I got an interview for CVS, but nothing was like happening At for me. At least you got interviews. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, from there, I think it got to like December of my junior year. So the end of freshman, I mean, first, first semester junior year. And I'm like, I don't have no internship and it's about to be the end for me. And so I went and I pulled the fortune 500 list of companies and I went down the entire 500 list and applied to every single company that had an IT internship. And so I ended up doing that. And then I got um, Cardinal Health called me and I interviewed there and I ended up getting an internship for them. Check you out, though, mm -hmm. for being strategic. Yeah. <laughs> At least they drilled it into you. Yeah. By the time I was like almost a, a senior, that's when I tried. But it was late. They, I, I just had so much bad advice in school Yeah. With, relevant to like getting internships. That's so why I tell everybody, hey, Tom, you step foot on campus, try to get an internship. Yeah, and and that's really, that's why I appreciate 
in the HBCU. I know people have their flack about, you know, the things that happen there. They don't have as much money or um, the facilities aren't up to date as the other um, PWIs. But really the advice that was given from the beginning that I got there was, you know, pivotal to my my growth there. A lot of people, I think, just being in college, you know, you're excited about being there and you may not, you tune down those conversations. But that really perked my ear to be like, hey, I, I, let me listen to the people that are here and they're really advocating for being a black professional um, in the work environment. So I really tapped into listening to the advice that I got there. And that really just helped me getting internships, going and, you know, presenting um, certain type of ways. We had um, conferences on how to have conversations, how to etiquette on how to talk at a table or, or set at a table. So but, I really appreciate all those things. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool because I ain't had none of that. <laughs> and I went to a PWI. Yeah, yeah. But to be fair, though, our school is more so known for engineering. Mm-hmm. Engineering probably paid for, like, most of everything. Yeah. So, like, the engineers were getting internships. Mm-hmm. Then, like, you know, architects and uh, interior design people, yeah. they're getting their internships. But our program was, like, a program, like, because CES falls under engineering. Mm-hmm. So, of course, but yeah. we was under the College of Business. So yeah. it wasn't, they didn't really care about us. Because mm-hmm. like, even at the career fair, there were rarely uh, enough companies there for IT. Yeah. As I went through school, it's back in like 2012, 2013, mm-hmm. they st- used to have more. But I was like doing interviews for stuff that didn't matter. Like yeah. I think from Sherwin Williams, I was going to be like a manager or something. Mm-hmm. Like all that stuff was not going to like, Help me out of my career. Yeah. So that's like the, the thing. Eventually, I don't know, maybe I may help them, maybe I may not try yeah. to help them. It's like, what are y'all doing here? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was the same at A&T because A&T is the number one public HBCU for engineers. So a lot of the things are funded mm-hmm. by the engineers. And so with b- business being like the second um priority at A&T so we got a lot of things for the business school because accounting is huge at A&T mm-hmm. as well so we um, had a lot of companies that was like leveraging the uh, engineering and um, business schools so I was able to you know use that to to get the access to that but it's the same thing where it was like that funding was like engineers yeah. was like powering like you know if you want to engineer you know be an engineer major if you want uh, actual internships because people will complain every time when I actually do work in the career service office it will be um, students that were seniors you know they were like art majors or fashion design or nursing and they're like there's no internships for us and I don't you know there's nothing we can do and all those things so it's like it's always people that are not those STEM majors that you know complain about they're not being a direction for them based on the school yeah and that's a but they have to take a different approach they if you're going to do a, a major that's, like, n- not a major, like, where you can kind of probably, like, go get a corporate job or mm-hmm. something, you need to go try to network and find people that do that type of stuff right. so they can plug you in. Hey, well, you need a portfolio. You need to do this. You need to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what you need to do. Yeah. If not, you're just going to be in school being broke. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So did you get, like, a type of offer or anything from Cardinal Health, or you just did the internship and then – you got your first job out of college. So I did. I did get an offer after. So I did um, my internship, did my presentation, and then they extended um, an offer to do a rotational program for three years after um, after graduating. So I was set coming back senior year. Like I, I oh, coasted t- during my senior year. I was like, I'm all set. I got. I came out. Um, I think I made sixty thousand um, coming out. So I was like, I'm set. I'm making more than most people. Oh, you out was of rich college. back then. Yeah. This was what? Yeah. This is 2014. Oh, so yeah, yeah. you was rich because yeah. I wouldn't. I think at that time I was making real close to 40. Mm. So I was like, yeah, you was yeah. rich. <laughs> yeah. So what, what roles did you rotate in in that program? So actually I didn't finish the program. Um, <laughs> so um, actually I got fired from my first job. That was my first job out of college and I got fired. So <laughs> did you get fired on your day off? I did not. <laughs> but um, for me, for that, I got fired um, based off of corporate politics. I didn't even get fired for not doing my work or anything. Just it was more so not knowing how to navigate through corporate America. That's really got, what got me fired. So um, during my time there, um, you know, I moved um, living in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I moved to Columbus, Ohio. I'm the only one there. You know, I don't have any friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm in a relationship. I was in a four year relationship um, during that time. So we are now long distance. I'm by myself. I'm yeah. out here and it, it's depressing. And um, I had a friend who I I ended up getting him a job 
at Cardinal Hill with me, but he was he was out in Chicago, <laughs> and right. I was I was by myself and I was really depressed, and that really took a toll on my mental health. And I would show up doing the bare minimum, like you know, I would just mm-hmm. do my job and go home. And my manager um, didn't like that, <laughs> especially yeah. um, being an African American in that you know where you see other if there's a black person there they're excelling and um when you're not excelling you stand out when you have all these black people that are there with you and they're doing just going over the top and doing that and when you're not doing that you're looked upon and you're like okay what's what's wrong with you you're not doing the best and from that um um with my depression going on um my manager just started to uh Dog pal. Yeah, just take note on things that was going on. So, the th- so you know, as the time was going on, I was there for about three months. And then my manager, we ended up having a one-on-one, and she calls me out, and she says, I want to put you on a pip. Oh, yeah, that and, means it's not a dip. Right, what, which I didn't know at the time, right? And so um, she was like, I'm, I'm putting you on a pip, and then she names out the reasons why she wants to put me on a pip. And so those being the first reason was um, – What's the first reason? The first reason was she went on a vacation, right? So she was gone PTO for a week. And during that vacation, I got sick one day. So it was like a Wednesday, I got sick. And on our team, it was just myself who was a full-time employee. And we had another, one of my coworkers who was full-time. So it was just the three of us. And my coworkers took all of my my, um, boss's responsibilities while she was gone. So I was sick one day and I said, hey, I'm not going to be in the office. Send an email to her. And when my manager got back, she was like, nobody knew where you were at. You you should have told another department. Just, you know, so she deemed that as um, an issue. A second reason was um, a part of the rotational program. We had a conference. And at the conference, the conference was from Monday to Thursday. And um, I decided I wanted to be on Friday because I'm like, I'm you know, the conference is Monday to Thursday. I'm not coming to work on Friday. So I had let her know that, hey, you know, for this, I'm not going to be in the office on Friday. And mysteriously, she didn't know that I was not going to be there on Friday. So I was dinged for that. Did you email her? Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. And I didn't document. This is in a uh, one-on-one. And I didn't document it. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, you know, so she's like, I, you never told me this. I, I didn't know you were go- off uh, office on Friday. Like, I didn't know until I wrote you and saw your um, out of office uh, email and you shouldn't have been out. So that was the second thing. The third thing was um, she was like, you know, the work starts at 8 o'clock. So at 8 o'clock, you don't need to be work, walking in the door at 8 o'clock swiping your badge. You need to be at your desk. And so um, she was like That's counting. That's a little every, micromanagement stuff. Yeah, like that. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> so me, you know, not knowing all this stuff where, like, you know, the things I just mentioned, I never I never documented my one-on-ones. I didn't, um, you know, just knew to, to how to navigate through this. And so when she put me on the PIP, I'm, I'm just thinking, oh, okay, well, I'll just do um, – you know what it takes what she's telling me to get off the pip I'm just going to do it because I'm like I'm a good worker I, I'll just do all the stuff that she's telling me to do and I'm gonna get off the pip and because you know my parents I told my parents is really the only people that I told that I was on it because I was embarrassed you know we're I'm in a three-year rotational program and I'm going I'm on a pip <laughs> you know months into this program and so I told them and my parents are military background and so for them you know when something happens you get reprimanded in the, the military you do what you're supposed to do check it off you move on and so for them they didn't they didn't have the knowledge to tell me how do you you know finesse in your way navigate through um, corporate politics and so from there um, you know, they was like, hey, just do what you need to do. You know, just tell, do everything she tells you to do. Um, I end up doing that. Um, and then the beginning of Thanksgiving, you know, I, my pip ended the week before Thanksgiving, right? So, you know, Thanksgiving, you know, I'm thinking we we completed it. She was like, yeah, you did everything, da, 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 we're done. I um, go home for Thanksgiving and then I come back uh, the following week, which is the first week of December. Your bags don't work. <laughs> no. Last it was Monday, right? You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm doing well, thinking, excited. That meeting from HR get put on my <laughs> that four o'clock meeting, and they're like, yeah, um, Terry, you're gonna have to. This is gonna be your last day, and I'm like, I but I did everything that was on the pip, like, and they were like, she was like, well, I just don't think you're a good fit, like, and I'm like, but I did everything that you told me to do, and she was like, well, I I just don't think you're a good fit. And I just packed up my stuff. I was devastated. And I just cried. <laughs> I cried. I called my dad. Um, the next day, he, like, flew out of Ohio. 
we packed up my stuff like the next day I was out of there I was back home so yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't last on that um that first job this video will be sponsored by level of careers it has a 14 day money back guarantee it's a we self paced course before your reimbursement and counts for continuing education here are some of the reasons why you can choose job security high demand job security competitive salary work variety and fulfilling work the national average salary of an information security analyst is of 113000 Your instructor is Josh Matacor, and here is the brief overview of the course. Theory introduction, security refresher, security frameworks, security regulations and standards, security operations symbols. Then you have these great labs with Azure, Login and Monterey, Microsoft Sentinel, Secure Cloud Configuration, and they help you with job hunt and job hunt execution. Use my code to try out level careers. You'll get 10% off by using my code and you'll be taking the next step in propelling your career to new height. Now back to our schedule program. Yeah. I think, and, and, and I'm glad like this is like a, a unique story for, I'm going to especially say for black people, yeah. and if, especially in the IT like rotational program, well, I'm sorry, new grad rotational yeah. program. The company should have it set up to where they are ingratiating you into corporate. Yeah. Because what you may do in college does not align with there. You yeah. need to have maybe, maybe not weekly, but maybe every couple of weeks, a one-on-one. Just mm -hmm. seeing, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? How are you feeling? You know, how, how are things at home? How is I mean, it can seem intrusive sometimes, yeah. but when you can figure out about somebody say, hey, they may be, they moved all the way from here. They probably don't even have any family right. here. I can ask those questions or like, hey, well, you know, we have, you know, this group for like, you know, black people mm -hmm. here, maybe join this to find yeah. some people, some friends and, and, yeah, and, and maybe help with that process. And, you know, I was a part of the ERG. So, you know, the employment resource groups and I joined it during my internship and the people that I connected to, like, for instance, um, I had a um, good friend, Ashanta, she was in the program. She was like uh, two years old. Like, so she was the, the in her third year mm -hmm. um, when I joined the company, her last rotation was in Puerto Rico. So she wasn't even in the country to have those conversations. And ultimately I was embarrassed because this is somebody who excelled at school. You know, like I mentioned about how, you know, determined I was to get an internship going down the fortune 500. Yeah. So I was always like just finding ways to navigate and to do better. Like during college, I was president of the AITP. I was president of like, I was doing all of these organizations. And so I excelled and coming into a place where I'm no longer excelling. It's embarrassing to kind of, and, and I had a lot of pride. Yeah. Right. So I, and I had, I didn't want to let that pride go. I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep this a secret. I ain't gonna tell nobody I'm on a pip <laughs> and I'm gonna <laughs> just, I'm gonna handle it and I'm gonna, you know, yeah. go forward. And, and that really, that pride is what stifled me and what ended my career because I honestly could have had those conversations with the, the advisors that were over the rotational program. And because I did have the conversation with them when I ever, I got on the pip, I did have a conversation with them and they were like, yeah, so what's going on and stuff like that. And there was no way that I could, prove the things that my manager was saying to me was incorrect because I had no documentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm speaking, you know, telling them, Hey, this is not what's going on, all, et cetera, et cetera, against someone who is, has literally been, uh, you know, building a case on me to say like, Oh, yeah. at, at eight Oh seven, I pinged her and she didn't respond to me because she's walking in the door, you know? So she's taking all these, you know, notes on me, all these copious notes and I have nothing and I'm trying to battle it with my, um, my mouth. And so, um, that really is what something that I just didn't, did not know. And I really feel like that's something that takes a lot of people that are trying to, you know, quote unquote, break into tech is because they think that, Hey, getting here is the final step and getting here is not the final step. It's the first step. And when you don't know how to navigate through, you know, corporate politics and even just the job alone, you'll find yourself in places like that where, you know, either you're stagnant and you're going to stay at that same level and you're not going to find ways to get promotions and, and move up and elevate in your career. And then you're also going to find ways where they're going to get you out, especially in this market. Like you, this, this is not the market to, um, you know, be playing around. Fortunately for me back then, 10 years ago, you know, I, I ended up getting another job two months later. So, yeah. you know, but nowadays you, you don't have that Liberty where you can, you know, you get into a nice job. You, you gotta, you gotta make it happen for yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I'll just say this before we go to the next subject. It's like, hey, when you know they're building a case, you know, just just start looking. Right. Yeah. And and um 
I had told my parents that I was like, I think I should just go. They was like, no, no, just, just get it over, you know, just stay and all that. And I'm like, I don't think she's going to like the way that she was just moving with me. It was very like nice, mm-hmm. nasty. And I was like, I don't, I don't think she's going to give up on this. Yeah. And, um, it got to, I think two weeks before. And my parents was like, if you feel like she's going to fire you, just do it. Cause like you'll get unemployment. I was like, well, that's true. <laughs> So that ended up working in that way. If you want to get unemployment, you know, you can let them go ahead and fire you. But I would say if if the PIP comes up, just already just immediately start looking for you should already you should never stop applying for jobs. Right. But just always be open to work. Yeah, always be looking. But when there's a PIP in place, just, you know, start moving even more expeditiously. Okay. Now T I um <laughs> <laughs> Listen, listen. So you got a job in two months. Mm-hmm. That's a fast time. Yeah. But then again, it was a different time back there. I definitely Very do feel so. like it was a, sh- a shortage of skill set back then, mm-hmm. even more so. So what was that role that you got in two months? So that was my first project management job. So, and I really feel like that was like the grace of God because the way that that job was like literally 20 minutes from my parents' house working with Northrop Grumman, which is, you know, okay. Vic DeVitt's contractor. Good tick. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, that was really God <laughs> that, that that worked out for me that it was like, but really what stood out for them for that job, it was a, um, a junior PM role. I had my, my BS and MIS. So that really already helped. So I had internships. So already, even if, you know, I didn't get fired, I still, my resume looked good. Even if I, I never told them um, that I was fair, fired. Cause even that was the um, advice of my parents. So don't tell them you were fired. Yeah. Don't say that. Why, why do they need to know that you're looking for a job? You moved here. You relocated from Ohio to my parents were living in Virginia at the time. So you relocated from Ohio to Virginia. That's what you need to tell them. Nothing more, nothing less. So, you know, what my resume looked like, you know, it was enough that it was like, okay, yeah, she got some skills. We want to give it to her because I I still had all the other things, my internships, my courses that I took in classes. So I looked like a a good quality candidate. Mm -hmm. So is that. Where, so was that first job, was it a little bit more technical or or what? Because I know now, like, you're specifically a technical program mm-hmm. manager, and that's where we'll actually, yeah. actually, matter of fact, let's talk about that now. What's the distinction between a regular program manager and a technical program manager? Sure. So with a technical program manager and a regular program manager, the – with the technical, obviously, you have more technical knowledge, right? So there's more there. There's an expectation that you know what your engineers are talking about. Um, what I've seen when things are called program manager, and it really varies just across companies because there are some just based off of um, what the company calls, and, and it really can't doesn't have to be a, a mm-hmm. difference, and it can just be in the job description. But um, for program managers, program managers can be in any capacity, any industry, any sector. And I really feel like that is something that most people don't realize when they say, hey, I want to break into tech. What do you want to do? I want to be a PM. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What do you want to work on? Like, what what, doma- what domains do you want to work on? Like, there's so much that happens there with being a PM, like you can go be a PM in healthcare. Like you yeah. don't have to, you don't have to be a PM for tech. That doesn't mean you're breaking in tech just because you want to be a project program manager. And I do want to tell that there is a difference between a project program and product manager, because a lot of these com- uh, companies are starting to like convolute those roles together. And people don't really understand the difference between the the three of those. But um, so a project manager um is one that just handles a project. So a project has a start and a finish, right? So you're managing time, scope, and budget on that project. So um, I like to use um, analogies to help explain things. So we were just listening to some music. So let's say we have a record deal or a record company, right? So Def Jam, right? And um, Def Jam has a new album coming out. Rihanna has an album coming out, right? A project manager will manage that album coming out. So from start to finish, getting the engineers to come and do the music, getting mm-hmm. Rihanna to come do the vocals, the, the marketing, you know, all of that. They will make sure from the time that it says that, hey, they say 
uh, April of 2025. Rihanna, please give us a new album. But, um, um, you know. Dream said it's done. <laughs> right. Like, and when she came on the Super Bowl last year, I was like, yeah, she's not giving us a new album. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, hey, April 2025, that's when the album needs to come out. So the project manager is handling everything that happens to meet that deadline, right? So let's say Def Jam says um, 2025, we want to be, have, all the artists, all of our Def Jam artists is dominating their genre. So every single artist that we have, we want them to be dominating their genre, right? So all the uh, program, or excuse me, all the projects that follow under that, what's dominate. So we want all our artists that are R&B to um, dominate the R&B charts. So that means uh, projects that are associated with Rihanna, projects associated with Drake, Usher, all of those projects so rihanna's album drake's album usher's album all of those are different projects right but they fall under a program mm -hmm. so that program manager handles getting to that strategic goal so the strategic goal is for those artists to dominate um their genre right so that is the strategic goal so program managers manage projects associated with a strategic goal so um it's more at a strategic level you're looking at trying to meet the company's goal so it's not just this one project like the project manager is just focusing on okay i just need to make sure by april 2025 that this project is done but the program manager is saying yes i need that to meet the deadline but i also need it to be meeting the company's goal which is to dominate the charts mm -hmm. and so they're trying to make sure that that uh, schedule falls in line with whatever um, initiatives to hit the um, timeline. So I hope right. that makes sense to you. And trying to figure out how to dominate the charts and spend as less money as possible. Exactly. And to be more efficient uh, with, you know, getting out speed and everything like that scalability. Um, and what about the product? Product manager, right? So a product manager is focused on the actual product. So let's say they're over all albums coming out, right? So all... Um, album. So everyone that has a, a CD at Def Jam, they're they're specifically over those albums. So what they're looking at is like, hey, what does an album look like? What is our market for this album? So they're going and they're looking at um, who is the target audience? Who is this? How do we um, how do we come out with uh, this stuff? Like for instance, so the analytics, like what does the audience listen to? What do they buy? Who do they like? Yes. Also, if YouTube tells me when I look at my interview. <laughs> yeah. So with that, like, for instance, like with the album for like Beyonce with Renaissance, um, the product manager will look like uh, would look at the audience and say, OK, what's the target audience? The, our audience is on TikTok. Our audience listens to um, social influencer. So let's send them a PR package. So they'll the feature would be looking at uh, a PR patch, and that's how they're that's how they're you know increasing what that product is. The product is the album, so they're like, okay, yeah, let me. What are the features can do we get to improve and to increase the sales? That so they're focused on the item, which is the product. Got it. That makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense because when you said that, I thought about Nicki Minaj going to uh, Casa Not. Mm -hmm. So trying yeah. to make an appeal to that that streaming yeah. audience. So mm -hmm. okay, yeah, cool. So that's Northrop Grumman. That would be the defense industry, correct? Yes, correct. So I know we can't talk about a lot of stuff there. Well, you know, and with Northrop Grumman, I didn't work on like the the government side. Okay. So I worked on more of the state side. So um, the contract that I was under was working with the state agencies of Virginia. So we were contracted to handle the IT infrastructure for the state agency. So I don't really have, okay, you cool. know, some clearance. I, I can talk about the things where that I worked so on. So do you have a clearance? I do not. And I'm so upset because I got laid off from North Grumman. Um, from, so I didn't get a chance to get my security clearance. I was on the list to get my secret clearance and we got laid off. So uh, North Grumman ended up cutting our contract. We They had a five-year um, contract with the state agencies, uh, with the state of Virginia, and they were not um, performing well. We were not, <laughs> of course. And then, you know, it, and it wasn't really that we weren't performing well. They just, you know, felt like another company um, could do it at a cheaper cost. So um, they ended up canceling the contract earlier. Um, fortunately for me, um, I had already felt like it was time for me mm -hmm. to start going. How somewhere. long were you there? I was there for three years. Okay, so now that took us from we was in we was graduated in twenty fourteen. Uh huh. So now it's twenty seventeen. Yes, twenty eighteen. 
So I graduated in 2014. I started at North Grumman in 2015 because remember okay. I got fired from my last year. And that's why you said Thanksgiving. So yeah, yeah. it should be a new year. Mm-hmm. Two months. You're right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So okay. I started March uh, 2025. I mean, 2025. 2015. Okay, yep. cool. And so you got laid off. Mm-hmm. What part in 2018? Um, So we got laid off August of 2018. Okay. So I yeah. see so you got laid off about like six months later than I did. I got laid mm-hmm. off in like... Really, I was told I was going to be laid off in January of 2018, uh-huh. but they said it's going to start in May. Mm. I mean, I'm sorry. It's going to start in February. Yeah. So it started in February. So at that time, I'm in grad school, and it was like, oh, we just will pay off whatever bonus at 100%. You'll get like an extra check and all this other stuff. I should have negotiated my, mm-hmm. my severance. But that's what we're, earlier we were talking about, like different songs at different times mm-hmm. around that time. It, like, it took me a while to, to find a job, another security job wow. back then. It um I don't know it, like when it comes to layoffs like I I have clients I work with that have been laid off like it kind of just goes through waves to where like you are maybe just doing interviews and stuff like that but eventually it gets to the point where now the offers start coming in because yeah. like I have a client recently who he's uh, his contract came to the end at the end of last year and then mm-hmm. so we were always interviewing towards last year and the beginning of this year but then all the offers started coming yeah and he got his big one what was it, like two weeks ago when we finally got the news that he's supposed to start next week? Yeah. But that's typically how it is in the layoffs. So it's like yeah. sometimes you got to weather the storm, and it yeah. sucks. At it that time, really I didn't have a family. It was just me. So yeah. it's it's much easier. Mm-hmm. And I would say, like, right now, like, if you are somebody in tech or in corporate, just save for a layoff day. Instead of rainy day, just save for yeah. a layoff. You just never know. Now, the hard part is, like, most of us, you may not be seeing most of your money because you may be helping family. This is that you the person in the family that made it. Ooh, but yeah. if you can possibly save some money for that, do that because it started getting towards the end where I made some tough decisions. Hey, am I pay rent or am I pay my car note? Yeah. I started making tough decisions. But by yeah. the time I got, I started my job back in June of 2018. I just, I, of course, I was making. I got a raise more than I was making at McAfee. Mm-hmm. I just had to catch back up. And yeah. because it was just me, I was like, cool. Yeah. But that's the things like some of the stuff, like we don't hear people talking about online. It's like, Hey, most of the time you will get laid off. It's just, yeah. it's, it's just like, if you don't, you know, you're a lucky person, but most people end up getting laid off. No matter, like you said, no from grumming. Cause people, well, yeah. you said you was on the state side. I know yeah. even though government contracts, like unless you just, Messing up, like you, you should be I'm good with the contract, right? <laughs> you, you definitely not getting fired from um, GovTech if you, you know, hopefully, with, especially with them clearances. It's a beautiful thing to have. Clearance. Well, with around the time you was working at Northrop Grumman for like, I started my career in 2014. Mm-hmm. I, at first, I was a contractor for Apex, and we were working for at the time CSC, which is now mm-hmm. GDIT. Yeah, and we. Over. <laughs> that's who uh, went for North that's funny the but contract. see we we had the tsa help this contract for years mm-hmm. but then by the time after i left i think they left they lost it mm-hmm. they start losing all their good talent you yeah. ain't gonna keep that contract if we if we going yeah. on top of maybe whatever else was going mm-hmm. on because they was getting over on the money yeah on my end i had i had to leave <laughs> i had to leave and that's why um when you talked about with layoffs that's why it's important to keep applying always even if you're in feel like you're in a secure job because for me my layoff situation was a little bit different because we found out, um, like I said, within the contract that we were in with the state, it was a f- um, five year. We was in the fourth year. And, you know, um, we found out in March that they or yeah, March or May that they were um, ending the contract. And I had already been applying for jobs and I had was interviewing for um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. And so um, when they found did the layoffs, I had got to the final round of that that interview so by june i had already secured the job at the federal reserve okay. so with miss keeper bag <laughs> something like that but um you know but going through the federal reserve i don't have a security clearance but i had to go through a public trust <laughs> clearance and going through all of that even though a public trust is not a full clearance but it, it takes a lot it's it takes weeks to get that so really? yeah like it, it, it took so much. I had to get fingerprinted. Like, just go, working for the Federal Reserve is a lot to to get into. Like, it was a yeah. great place to work. Um, It's not, you know, full gov tech. But, you know, we do a lot of um, contracting and, and vendoring with the with IRS and Treasury. So um, there was a, a lot of um, 
there was a lot of like monitoring or, or background yeah, checks. I entered, yeah. Stuff. Uh, and then even like my friends, like they uh, had to put it on like people that I work with, like two people that know me personally, two people from each of my jobs. And my friends were like, they were like, yeah, they were asking like, <laughs> so you have to like do like a, uh, what's it called? Equip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do equip. Like my clearance actually is about to probably like go away soon because I haven't mm-hmm. used it yeah. in years. Yeah. I'm I'm so upset. Like in the, cause I was on the list um, because we are you know being at North Grumman, we already knew that this was you know the contract was going. So they were already preparing us to you know hey what's going to be your next place? Do you want to go in North Grumman? And I was in Richmond, Virginia, and you know headquarters for North Grumman. One of the headquarters is in uh, Falls Church, Virginia, so DMV area. So that's about two hours from from Richmond and so they were like hey there's some stuff up there and if you you can get a sponsor to get start your um security clearance so I was on the list to get my security clearance but we got laid off so I I didn't get to um fully go with that but back to um just with the layoff situation so my start date for um the Federal Reserve was the week (laughs) we got laid off so I got my severance. <laughs> I went up there for like, when well, you know, one day signed the paper. I didn't even try to like negotiate or anything. I was just like, whatever. I already got another job. So I was like, I went up there for one day, signed severance <laughs> and, you know, got my paycheck for um, my new job. So that's why it's important to just constantly. And I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows that now because everyone is such in a panic with the <laughs> way the job market is going. It, it's it's crazy like this is the worst job market i've never struggled to like find you know consistent roles that are reaching out companies reaching out to me it's been a struggle all around yeah we'll we'll definitely get into uh some of that Mm -hmm. and i was going to touch on you your stuff about the federal reserve bank remind me of freaking working for goldman sachs background check was (laughs) like felt like a security clearance (laughs) yeah like everything write all this stuff down this Mm -hmm. down and but then them, it's like stricter than the government. They all in your biz. Oh, you can't buy this stock. Oh, you can't do this or that. Yeah. Disclose. I'm going to tell you all something. Hey, if, if a job is actually disclose outside stuff, don't. Mm-hmm. Just If they find out and they find out, just let them find out. And then you could probably quit by then. Because by then, they're going to try to make you stop. And it's going to become an issue. So don't disclose it. Like I never told them, oh, I got this business. And I do mm-hmm. this or that. Because some type of way, they'll try to make me career coaching and content creating all that stuff. Yeah, conflict of interest. And it's not. Yeah. So I'm like, no. Yeah, I I worked at Bank of America last year, and it was the same thing. They were like, you have to disclose all this. And I'm like, I don't plan on being here for long. <laughs> and I was like, I, I wish I would disclose yeah. and stuff to y'all. Like, the only, I think they ended up finding out I had a fidelity account. But mm-hmm. I wasn't really actively trading. But some stuff I did want to buy sometimes on a whim, and I had to mm-hmm. just put the request in. Yeah. But I think I used to ping the person, like, yo, I need this approved. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. so... North Grumman is pretty much where you got into the infrastructure side. So is there a specific infrastructure that is your niche that you come into companies and work with? Yeah. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the projects that I work on is associated with build outs. So whether a company is building out a new facility, um, new data center, which is becoming a huge thing. That's really like yeah, what companies my, going back on prem. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And even just like with cloud computing, um, and, and AI as in general, like that has to be, that data has to be hosted somewhere. And so mm-hmm. there's, you know, the need for data centers everywhere. When I say there's just so many data centers that even just here in Dallas, yeah. there's so many data centers being built up like Google, like Amazon. I see them all the time. Like yeah. we service now, Hey, this is the data center in, in yeah. Dallas. And, and I work at um, one of the, it's a smaller tech company, but it is a, a um, prime data center provider and business is starting to boom for my company so um yeah data center um build outs are really what i my prime baby is but networking is another thing that i just always networking and firewall (laughs) is just where you know i always landed in projects and i really just you know grabbed onto it learned the technology and just been just going through it cool before i ask you specifics about the networks Mm -hmm. and firewalls that you probably help um, build out and implement yeah Let's give them this. What's a typical day like for you being a technical program manager that specializes in networks and data centers and everything else yeah. infrastructure related? So a lot of meetings, <laughs> a lot, a lot of meetings, um, depending on the project. Um, a lot of times 
whether or not there are clear requirements um, for what is talked about. Usually it is defining what we're actually working for. A lot of times companies say, hey, I want something done, but they have no clue what they need. They don't have anything. And um, usually depending on how uh, mature a company is, they may have business analysts to help with that front end project to figure out what the requirements is. But a lot of times the budget isn't there for that. So they usually the PM does that meeting with sponsors, meeting with your stakeholders, trying to figure out exactly what they're pinpoint, exactly what they're looking for and what they're trying to do. So, Hey, what are the dates that you're looking to? What are, what's in scope? What are the resources that we're going to need? So that usually starts off the beginning of the project is trying to pinpoint exactly what we're needing to do. And so even if we're farther into the project and we're now building out what that looks like, what is different from a, you know, normal PM is whenever there are different um, tech documents that come out. Um, hey, this is the type of fiber that we need, or this is the um, type of cables. And I kind of couldn't know based on just the knowledge of what I've been, I can kind of have those conversations with my engineers to say, hey, this is level one. This is, you know, I can have those conversations based on, you know, not based off of, um, what an uh, a typical program manager sometimes I don't know <laughs> and it, you know I'm fake it till I make it right and but there's some things that I can pick up on on where it's like hey we're about to cable in a 48 port switch maybe that we need a 120 and we're have I can have those conversations based off of just the requirements so I don't have to lean on my engineers to ask a lot of dumb questions because I know a lot of y'all engineers <laughs> y'all hate when we come and we ask a lot of like dumb questions so I can kind of be that filler to not have to have to go for to them to say hey what's this technical question but like I mentioned about program management it's about being strategic and you know every company has something that they're trying to do for a project a project is done for a reason it's never done because yeah. you know hey we just didn't want to do this it's always something are we saving money is it going to make you know, more money time faster, you know, and all those things. It's all about doing those things. So when you don't have a person that has to rely on, Hey, let me go ask this person. Let me come back to you. And they can, you know, they have the knowledge themselves to be able to have those conversations. It helps. And that's what being a, a TPM helps with, or even um, like I just mentioned where maybe we're building out, we're doing some refreshes. I do a lot of like end of hardware, end of life um, projects. That's really <laughs> A big bulk of being an uh, infrastructure PM is that end of life migrations, all of those things. So when we start to have those conversations and it's, hey, um, we want this, you know, this um, server is coming to the end of life. Do we want to put it in the cloud? Do we want to keep it on prem? You know, hey, there's another server that's similar. Do we want to migrate all that data together and, and just have one big server? So like having those conversations, I, I can start to ask the, the right questions with my engineers. Ooh. And so, yeah, that's what helps me with being a TPM. This video is being sponsored by Techpreneurs Club. If you're interested in getting to DRC, then watch this. Techpreneurs Club provides comprehensive training and governance risk and compliance, empowering individuals to play a pivotal role in fostering trust between organizations and their value vendors and clients. Here are some of the things that they offer in their program. Recorded video content, live sessions, advisor meetings, meetings with coaches, resume and account bidding, and job applications. In the last couple of years, one of the hardest things for people to do is take all the information they learned and put it together in order to stand out in the interview process. And that is what Techpreneurs shows people how to do going through their program. Here's some of their alumni work and here are some of their success stories. So if you're interested in starting your career in GRC, then I suggest you check out Techpreneurs Club. The link will be in the description below. So are there any type of applications or softwares that you use on a day to day that makes your job like easier or you would call them essential? Um, so right now, um, and this is something that I hate it, but it's something I have to use because it's just the, the protocol of my company. Um, I use Jira. So Jira is, um, what we usually use in a agile methodology. So the two prime, um, methodologies in project management uh, for managing a project is waterfall and um, agile. And so the difference of waterfall and agile waterfall is from start to finish. If I was to build you a car and you say, Hey, I want a car. This is what I want the car to look like. You give me the order and I make it. And then I hand you over a car. Right. And with agile, agile is taking every single part of the car 
and breaking it down. So it is, hey, I want a car. Okay, what do you want the steering wheel to look like? Okay, I want the steering wheel to have leather and red trim. All right, and then we're going to go do a sprint for two weeks, yeah. and we're going to work on it. And then I'm going to give it back to you and say, is this what you want? Okay, yeah. All right, so that goes, and then we take something else that's out, you know, in the backlog, and we say, what's another feature that you want? Okay, um, car paint. Do you want blue? Do you want? And then so there's a, a two week, you know, the sprints that you do with that. So agile is doing the iterations, the, mm -hmm. you know, going step by step. And, you know, you're going through that and, you know, working with a customer to get a project done with waterfalls. You give me the order and I give it back to you, what you give me. And so in infrastructure, because of the nature of infrastructure, servers, networking, you can't. There's no agile in that, right? You, you can't, I can't make, give you a server and be like, okay, do you want these cables here? Or do you, you know, you, you can't do that. So most of my projects are waterfall, but companies are so focused on being agile. I have to use <laughs> agile functionalities in, in domains. So I use Jira to do waterfall projects, which is very irritating because I'm not running sprints. <laughs> so, right. um, so um, Jira is one of the main um ones that I use my company um, previous companies that we use Microsoft project, which was big and huge, but um, my company, we don't have a um, specific um, project scheduler that we use. Um, so I use smart sheets, Excel as basic as Excel is, it is, is a lifesaver um, really for pinpointing those things and breaking down the different tasks that are associated with mm -hmm. um, each of the project and they just really uh, leveraging that. I like to go real old school and uh, use pen and paper <laughs> to, to really task out things. It really helps. If you remember. Yeah, it really does. And it helps to just get things and, and navigate things in, like a whiteboard. So um, those are really the main things. Jira, um, Smartsheets, those are really the prime ones that I use. Even I've worked in companies that use ServiceNow, which I, I hate to use ServiceNow as a, a managing a project management platform, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Funny enough that you said something about two week sprints. <laughs> when I was at JP Morgan, my role was like I was I, I pretty much was kind of tasked to being like a product manager of this product that they want to push out within my team, and then I also did a lot of um, assurance type of work. We worked on um, firewall rule violations for the different lines of business mm -hmm. in the company and we're trying to see like why are you violating or why it's not fixed right. <clears throat> but anyway the whole year i was doing the sprints i had before that i used jira but it wasn't an agile way i come from security threat ops incident response so if i was assigned something it's like oh hey we put this detection in jira we want you to go check it out and mm -hmm. da, 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 put your comments down and close it out mm -hmm. that's all i used to be when they put me, I was in Jira doing all these things. I'm just moving them from yeah. every week. He was like, like board. yeah, he yeah. was like, nah, you gotta, you gotta close these out and then start some new stuff, some new mm -hmm. two week sprints. I was like, I wish you would have told me that. Cause I just been doing it the wrong time. Yeah. Cause he was like, yeah, you gotta do all these that way. So now when it comes to review time, you say, Hey, I did all these different sprints, all these different projects I created. This is what I did. This mm -hmm. is what I contributed. I was like, well, y'all didn't explain that. Y'all know my yeah. background is different. <laughs> I bought a whole different mindset to yeah. it, but it, it definitely was not a good fit. So mm -hmm. I, I could, I could see that. So like when I, I was only there six months. Yeah. And when I left, my manager was like, you know, I'm not surprised because <laughs> within like two or three days, I was like, oh, I don't know if this for me. Like, yeah. how long got to stay in this role? Because I was going to try to move around internally, but mm -hmm. you know, HR, hey, you got to stay there for about you know, yeah, a year. I was like, no way, not Jose, yeah. I ain't doing that. But something I was thinking about the whole time where you was talking. Mm -hmm. Where the scrum fit in with y'all jobs? Because I'm very confused at what is a what do they even do? I am laughing because I have a PM group chat, and I literally just a couple of days ago, someone was like, "How's all the scrum masters do it?" Because it is something that I feel like in the industry is coming on. Well, like you don't see too many jobs hiring for scrum masters. And so scrum masters fall under agile. So it's a job where when you're running the sprints, that is the person that is, you know, every day you're when, during sprints, you'll have your day, daily you stand up. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I, I don't do a lot of agile projects. Um, but during those daily strength sprints, you have someone that is there. That's kind of like um, the person that's, you're telling what obstacles you're facing and they're, they're working to get whatever obstacles you're facing within those sprints and, you know, piling through that. So that usually is what happens 
with the scrum master, but it's it's a job that I'm feeling it's fading based, away. Yeah, but just based off of the strategic na- nature of jobs where they're looking to save and cut costs, they're like, oh, the product owner can do that or the project manager can do that. I don't need a, a another person <laughs> that Not can only do that. This. I mean, for me, even in like my own business, I use Otter AI when I'm doing consultations. Yeah. So Otter's the all the highlights, all the links I sent, all that, and it's mm-hmm. sending it to them after the meeting. Yeah. And that's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate, oh, like Zoom has the new AI company. Oh, they do? On it. Yeah. And I love it. I use Google Meet because I was like, why am I paying for Zoom? I use Google Meet. For <laughs> but l- like during my company, we have it. So like AI, comp- I like because a lot of my job is, you know, with meetings and it takes so much to be a note taker. And I feel like as a project manager, we kind of get a bad rep that by thinking that we're just, you know, glorified note takers and we're not because a lot of it is managing people. And so mm-hmm. with AI, cause I hear a lot like, Oh, are you scared that, um, you know, AI is going to take over project management? Absolutely not. Because it is a job that it's about managing people. Yeah, and it's, AI can't interact with people. Like exactly. That. And but see, here's the thing too, but a lot of companies, it's so much red tape depending on what industry you're in, they are not going to use, yeah. AI, yeah, because they just from you know a legal standpoint yeah. they just can't because yeah, too many they, proprietary. They don't know who has access to the data once it's gone. Yeah. So, like that's a crazy thing. Like in finance, like you can't even use like I'm like bro, some of these meetings could have been emails. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's use Loom or some pre-record the video, send it out to us. Yeah, why am I on here mm-hmm. talking to y'all? Yeah. That's that's one thing I I don't miss like being in the finance industry, especially like classifying different uh, emails that was sending out and just at the Federal Reserve, it was such <laughs> like you said, it was red tape about everything that you send out. You you accidentally put a USB to the computer that you're being drilled down and what what did you connect to it and you know so like you I said, like that though <laughs> make my job easier yeah because. If you not, people could put anything in a computer, like yeah. a first, uh, was it First Republic Bank? Mm-hmm. You know how that went down. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to get on to this real quick, cause. So when did you move out here, and why Dallas? I moved out here in 2021, and I didn't move out here for a job or anything like that. No relationship either. Um, I had just been living in Virginia for you know, five years at mm-hmm. that point. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I got fired from a job and I moved back with my parents and I w- had been staying with my parents for a while. And I was just like, I'm, I'm ready for some change. Um, my parents are military. So we moved like, you know, my entire life, I've moved three years, mm-hmm. you know, at max when I got to high school and stuff, we stayed in Fayetteville. So that's why I call that home. But for the most part, we moved around. So like when it gets about three years or so, I'm like, okay, it's, it's kind of time to pack up and go somewhere. And so I was like on five years of living in Richmond. And I was like, I just, I want to do something different. I want to go. First start. Yeah. And um, originally I was going to move to Raleigh, North Carolina, because Raleigh has um, RTP, which is the research triangle park there. And it, it has tons of companies like Cisco is there. Um, just, just yeah. a, a whole I bunch of, um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of companies just right there in Raleigh. So I was thinking about moving to Raleigh, but I was like, I want like Greensboro is probably like a good hour from Raleigh. So a whole bunch of people that went to A&C went to Raleigh or, and then I was like, Charlotte, I don't want to move to Charlotte. Atlanta was a absolute no. I did definitely did not want to move to Atlanta. I'm like, Atlanta is a good time to visit is, you know, there for a good time, not a long time. What about so, Houston? So that was another thing. So, um, so I'm exed out of Atlanta. DC was another one. I was like, no, because I was. It's keeping up with the Joneses in in, yeah. in DC, and I was like, I heard it's very like elitist. Like, oh, what do much. you do? Um, yes, who you work for? Uh huh. It very much so. And then also, I hated the traffic in DC. Every time I would go to DC, because Richmond's only two hours from DC, so I was like, I hated the traffic, and it got more snow than Richmond. So I was like, I didn't want to be stuck in the snow. Um, and so I was like, Texas sounds nice. I was like, Texas sounds real nice, and I was like. Dallas, Dallas sounds like somewhere I could live. And I was like, but Houston also sounds like somewhere I can live. And I was like, Houston's a little bit fast. I don't know if I could handle Houston. I was like, nah, I think Houston I actually slower. I was thinking that it was fast. Cause I was like, I, when I think of Houston, I think of a, it's like a baby Atlanta. So I was like, I was like, maybe, maybe Houston. So like I started applying for jobs in Houston, like nothing was open, like no doors was opening. I was like, okay. And, and it just didn't feel right. I was yeah. like, I don't know something about Houston doesn't feel right. And then I was like, okay, what about Dallas? And Dallas just felt right. And so my mom's um, family, um, my mom's from LA, but 
my grandparents ended up moving to Oklahoma in the 90s. Okay. So, like, I would go spend my summers in Oklahoma. So, you know, Oklahoma is three hours from Dallas. So, like, I was like, okay, close to my grandma, close to, you know, my mom's side of the family. I'm like, Dallas sounds really nice. And I started applying to jobs for Dallas. I got a job here, and I just moved, like, packed up my car and, and drove to Dallas. So, that's why I moved here. Okay, check you out. <laughs> and so, that was, what, going on three years now. Yeah. So, was did you move here for Bank of America? No, so I uh, moved here for another company. It's called it's a healthcare company. It's called Genesis Care. Um, I, think they, I think I heard them before. I've seen them on Indeed. Yeah, they're um, a oncology, so they're a network of um, cancer um, cancer doctor mm-hmm. uh, patient. I'm saying patients, oncology <laughs> clinic. So um, that's what I ended up moving here for because they originally um, I was remote. Um, when I started that position, um, and then they had, um, they had, uh, um, thought about moving, putting a headquarters in Dallas. So, um, I believe like 2023, they were expect- anticipating after COVID to, um, build out a headquarters here. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm already going to move to Dallas. So that's going to work out. Um, but I was remote for that job. So that's why I originally, um, got the job and moved out here. But so you stay there, then you go to. So did, when you got here, did you just figure like it went right? So you just trying to find a company that's the right fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. I just went for, and then from me going from the Federal Reserve because ultimately, um, I could have just went to the Federal Reserve of Dallas. But my friend used to work there. Yeah, I um, because I because even though I worked at the Federal Reserve of Richmond, I wasn't technically in the Federal Reserve of Richmond. So there's the banks. So you have Federal Reserve Dallas, Federal Reserve of New York, but there's another um, organization called Federal Reserve of IT. So it's called FRIT, and so that's what I was more so okay. in. But it was um under the Federal Reserve of Richmond, and so from there, so I could have just you know went to the Federal Reserve of Dallas, but. I wanted a pay jump. Like I jumped from, um, I had a $20,000, no, $30,000 increase from where I was at the Federal Reserve to my new job at Genesis Care. If you don't mind us asking, like, you know, you know, we're in a time of uh, salary (laughs) transparency. (laughs) That, so I hit my, that's when I hit six figures was going from, so at Federal Reserve, I was at, um, what was it 65 mm-hmm. 70 i don't know i ended at 70 75 something around i i was at 70 so i was at 70 and then um when i started at 105 was what i started at being a just scare nice nice look, look realistic stories yeah. people yeah realistic stories yeah, and, and i was um at that point so now you know i started at um and how i said i um my first job i started at 60k but when I got fired, um, you know, I was willing to take anything because I was, you know, I was embarrassed. I was, I needed a job and I went down to 50. So, you know, uh, I took a cut yeah. just, you know, cause I needed a job. And so I went from 50, um, at Northrop Grumman, which Northrop Grumman, I, oh, I feel like the defense industry and in pay there, they, they, they really don't want to pay. And that was, they, don't. they, that was one of the, the most jobs I had the most work like it was so much work and i'm like for what y'all are paying for what i know now i'm like for what y'all were paying it's yeah. it's ridiculous yeah my friend works at lhm and drives to fort worth every day and they don't want to pay yeah. and he's getting underpaid because he like do the job of like a team of like four or five would do yeah yeah i had somebody um they um i know somebody that just got a offer for lockheed and um for what he was going for he said the offer, and I was like, I'm not surprised because I'm like, Northrop Grumman is their competitor, and they don't want to pay. So I'm like, I'm su- not surprised they don't want to pay you because they they don't pay in the defense industry. So, like, I love uh, Simone B's um, content because I didn't even know. Like, I kind of X'd out going to GovTech because I was like, I know what Northrop Grumman is paying. I'm like, there's mm-hmm. no way you're getting paid this way. So I love her content that she gives, an, you know, insight and how to navigate through that. Yeah. Um, Hopefully she's. She stopped through. She's supposed to be in Dallas sometime. So awesome. Like, Dope. Who knows? Who knows what we got cooking up? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so with that, just, you know, I, I ended up dropping salaries to, you know, get another job. And I think, uh, you know, people are so much on this chase to get six figures that they don't realize, hey, maybe I need to take something a little bit smaller. It may start off at 60, start off at 70 and, you know, and make your way up. I didn't start at 100K. I didn't come into this. It took me years. You know, I was basically seven, 
seven years into this before I reached six figures. So same. I think I really started consistently hitting it in about twenty nineteen. Yeah, about twenty nineteen yeah. to twenty twenty. So really p- pandemic time. Mm-hmm. But no, I've, I've done it. I've, I've taken a handsome haircut to go into a role that I like. When I left JP Morgan to mm-hmm. the other place. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I definitely understand that I was strategic about that though in ways of how I got my compensation to be what I needed it to be. Yeah. As well as other things I do to offset whatever I need to pay for. So mm-hmm. a lot of people probably aren't doing that. But I always say like if you don't have no kids or nothing, I like I tell my clients all the time, if you, if if the offer can pay your bills and you need the experience, take the offer. Yeah. It, it's okay. Mm-hmm. You ain't it, only keep up with yourself. Like, I ain't worried about keeping up with nobody. I'm not a, a flashy individual. Nobody knows me for that type of content. Yeah. I have you like, if you got to just have a job to just take some money is better than zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely um, in this market, you definitely want to have the skills to set you apart. And if going to a job that pays a little less but gives you the experience you need that that's more valuable because that sets you apart and I think a lot of people especially because of social media are chasing um are chasing money and not realizing that that's no longer going to set fit in where the market is this is an employer market and um you have to do what it takes to stand out exactly let me see if I can find it because my girl uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Shatora Mills on TikTok um, I think that I, th- I'm not sure. Thank you. I cannot find her. She's always putting people on game. When Is it- she like light skinned? Yep. Um, I have literally just seen one of her videos yesterday. Um, okay, look, here she go. This is a good one. Let's listen to this and I'm take and let me know what you think about this. Okay. This job market is tearing a lot of people up and it's because of decisions they made. So I'm going to explain. Let's talk about it. One of the biggest things that happened was we all understood that for some reason, people who were willing to leave their employers and go after new opportunities were more likely to increase their income. When we look at their income, it will always outperform those who stayed at a company for a long period of time. But one of the things that people did not understand, when you move and you job hop and you're moving laterally, chances are the skills that you're getting are the same ones that you've had. But it's not until you have a strategy and you say, when I job hop, I job hop for money and a new set of skills that would give me a return on my investment once I stay at this company and when it's time to leave, I know exactly what my skill set will be worth. So a lot of people are in this job market right now. The problem is you want a certain amount of pay and now these companies are literally saying we cutting this pay in half, but the thing you never invested in was a high paying skill set. That was your mistake in job hopping. Now move more strategically. That's definitely facts. I, I, yeah, I started following her yesterday. I seen another video she did. I think probably it was a response to that video. And yeah, I, I, yeah, I immediately right followed her. Like, she's great content. Um, I'm, I definitely want to connect with her. So I got you. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely enjoyed what she was speaking. And I uh, definitely agree. And I think even from that, um, perspective, even with this overemployment thing that everyone has been talking about, um, even with that, I, th- I think people re- need to understand in that component, you, that's still a lateral move because you cannot exceed and do greatness when you're overemployed. And I got a theory, but I, I will not, I will <laughs> tell close. you offline, <laughs> yeah. but you're, you're right. And I made a video a couple of, like a month ago and it was about job hopping mm-hmm. and the, the thumbnail said, don't job hop just yet. Yeah. And I was talking about the same thing, how you're job hopping to the same job, you're getting paid more, but your skills are not increasing. Mm-hmm. Whereas that person, and I was talking about myself, where the job that I landed after I laid off, I stayed there almost four years. Yeah. But I had got so many different skills from technical skills, from being a regular SOC analyst level two to a SOC lead, mm-hmm. so management type of leadership skills, to where when I left to go to Goldman Sachs, I had all these different skills to where my pay went like this. So right. now every other time, I got all these things I've, I've shown and proved I can do that. Some people are just putting their head down. Okay, I'm going to go here. So they have no real things they accomplished or anything when yeah. I do their resumes or 
just talking to them and they're trying to get certain pay. And I was like, it's not there. I'm talking to one of my other friends. All of us have been like a lot of my contemporaries. Most of us have been in a decade plus or some mm-hmm. eight years, whatever. And we're telling people, hey, a lot of y'all who are trying to be remote, it's actually kind of reserved now for people who got high skill sets yeah, now. Absolutely. Or like, of course, sometimes some of it is industry based where, hey, they want you to be hybrid. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, you're not going to see that because that's what me and my, my friend was talking about at work at Lockheed. Like he, he was like, man, how you, you've been working remote for what I was like, I've been here long enough to where, hey, I could be remote. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, it, and it's the same for with PM roles that, like I mentioned with um, now with um, TPM roles, because I do want to, I think, I don't think I was clear about with a PM and a TPM that, you know, you can be a project manager in any industry. So construction, yeah. healthcare, all of those things. And, um, you know, just going to go get a PMP or anything like that is not going to make you marketable. Do you have a PMP? I do. I do. Okay. And, and don't they check like that your PMP is valid and real? Um, it depends on not the, the job. The, I'm talking about the actual institute. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you have an ID. <laughs> There's an ID that comes with it. You have to renew every three years. I just renewed um, last month. So um, there, you know, there's the ID that comes with it, and you know, people want to to fake to get a um, a PMP and all those things. So you saying a, a PMP plug cannot get you? Cannot successfully show that you got PMP because there's a person who's on TikTok and Twitter and and they have a a PMP plug that makes telling people make stuff in Canva that like a PMP and fake degrees and all that and and riling people up. I mean, you can just go to PMI and if they really wanted to verify, just like going to saying you went to a a certain college, they can go call those institutions and and figure that out. But even with that, okay, you went to this PMP plug and they gave you a PM uh, or PMP. Okay. But what skills do you have? (laughs) You know, because now looking at these job postings, they're not just saying, Hey, do you have project management experience experience? They say, do you have knowledge about cloud computing? Do you know machine learning? They, there is certain technical mm-hmm. knowledge that you have to have if you're going to be a TPM. And, um, you know, you have people that are like, hey, I've been a, a, a project manager. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll say wherever they've been at. But even with that, if you're a project manager that's been in marketing or a project manager that's been in high education, it is you have a, a better chance than someone that's not in the tech industry to transfer, but it's still, it's a competitive yeah. market that you're less likely to get someone that has the technical backing, you know, that has experience that understands each domains that understands different uh, devices that understand, you know, that there's different capacities in, um, in it that they know. So that is just as important being a TPM than it is just the PMP. So there's people that's going for these PMPs because they hear people, Hey, what's the easiest way to break into tech and be in a non-technical role, which is being a scrum master or being a a PM. And that's not going to save you in this market. Yeah. And I've also seen a trend too of people like, and I will say, what was this? 20 into 2022. I had just finished interviewing at Microsoft. Mm -hmm for a role, but then another Microsoft recruiter reached out to me for actual technical program or project manager type of role uh-huh. or whatever. And I think it was around like some type of security stuff. Mm-hmm. So in, like, you're right. Like they would, which I had no experience doing it, but I think if I was interested, I probably could do it based off of skill set, skill set and things I do. It's like so many things I've realized the, sk- the skills that I've gained outside of work that mm-hmm. I've did with this, yeah. like, marketing and reaching out hey what I want to do I've had to work with producers and editors on my LinkedIn mm-hmm. course or yeah. deliverables like all those different things I've really built another skill set I could go market myself for if I ever had yeah. to and now honestly for these companies for TPMs they are rather they would rather take an engineer becoming a PM than just you know some Joe Smo trying to become a PM because they understand that engineer you can teach the soft skills right yeah but those hard skills you know, yeah, the, and it, it exactly. takes time to learn that. And I can know if you BS in me or not. Right. Yeah. Like who you can. I, I read I know how long something takes. Exactly. Don't play me. Like just just get it done. Mm-hmm. And and that's it'll be that. Yeah. And and that's where um 
you know, I, I think with people with these non-technical versus technical roles, you know, when I tell people that I'm, I'm a PM, it's like, oh, you don't do anything. You don't know anything. And I'm like, but I have a IT, you know, I go through my background and um, they're like, oh, you actually, because just because I hate it when people say like, oh, I'm a PM, I'm a person in tech. And they, they say, I work for this company, which the only thing that makes them technical is the, the, company. The, the company. And it's like, no, you are in marketing. You are in HR. You are, you're, in, you know, the, and that's where people are getting the, the miscon, uh, misconstrued about a PM is that they don't realize that these are different industries. Just because you're a PM doesn't make you in tech. Being an IT PM makes you in tech. I like that hot take. I might have that for the intro. <laughs> but I think that's one of the things, right, we were talking about earlier, how people messed up the game with going to get massage, I'm going to get a latte, yeah. and all this other stuff. The content, that doesn't even really work anymore on yeah. TikTok. They are attracted to that lifestyle. So that's why they are thinking non-technical roles are so easy. And I'm like, yeah. if these people are going to pay you $150,000, $160,000, you don't think they don't want you to work? Yeah. You don't find that suspicious. <laughs> you don't find that suspicious. Like that's what they that's what they think. They yeah. think that okay, I'm gonna get all this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do three out two hours of work, and that's it. And a lot of people have not earned that right yeah. to do that. And that's another thing she talks about: people that have like knowledge based uh, jobs or task based roles. Yeah, that that's just ludicrous. Like that's what like. I know I sound like I'm saying that's why, that's why, but I'm just thinking through my head. You, you'll see LinkedIn and you'll see, you know, of course, like you'll have roles that may be non-technical or they're, they're getting laid off. There's a mix of both. There are yeah. a mix of good people getting laid off. Then there's a mix of people that just aren't performing that's yeah. getting laid off. I've noticed that maybe a lot of the people who just got in pandemic got laid off mm -hmm. because, hey, they're a lot of them just have, aren't working on their skill set. They aren't doing the things you need to do. Like, Go back to what Shatora talked about because it's one of the things I talk about in my LinkedIn learning course because I learned this at Goldman Sachs. But I was already doing it at Optif. But I specifically learned it because I was in a new org and they were telling me how to finesse because how they based on that organization, right. visibility. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know what you're working on or what projects you've helped right. do for the company or how you help them save money. Yes. So you need to get on that town hall or yes. the all hands or that quarterly call and, and present. Yeah, and and that's that strategic component that I was, um, you know, speaking about earlier is that you you have to know what your what your value is for the company. You can't just go in and say, "Oh, I'm pen testing," or "Oh, I'm," you know, yeah, yeah. just uh, you're just doing the job. You're checking it off, but you don't even know how you have the the value for that. And that's why, even for me, um, when it comes to me being a TPM, I'm. Yeah, I have my PMP, but that's not the only certifications that I'm I'm going for. Like right now, I'm studying for the AWS cloud computing because I'm getting deeper and deeper into having technical knowledge because I can't just I can't stand out if I'm yeah. just a PM that OK, I can manage projects. Great. So can, you know, the homeless guy across yeah, the street can do you the same thing. Get on the call and ask us, you know, what's the best EC2 instance yeah, to use? Exactly. And so like those things that, you know. Building my technical knowledge puts me ahead of the game because also that can give me a chance to pivot because, um, you know, the people that the delivery managers or the the uh, managers of different uh, resource teams, most of them are not technical people. You know, as the higher you go up, the, yeah. the more, the less technical you are. So even in a managerial role, if I wanted to go um, be a manager for a data center, that's a, a, a non-technical role, but that has the technical knowledge. And so to stand apart, you have to strategically yeah. know something. Hey, what what are you good at? Like like I mentioned at the beginning of this, you know, I my niche is uh, build outs, facility build outs, data center build outs. So when people come and look at my um, LinkedIn, they see infrastructure, they see build outs, they see um, IT transformation. And those are huge components about a companies. Companies are looking to save money, transforming the the hardware they're using. They're looking to save money going from um, on-prem yeah. devices to cloud. And you really have to know where you stand, stand out. In, automation. Yeah. And it, exactly in automation, it's, it's going to take jobs. It's going to take tech jobs. And I know everyone in tech thinks, Hey, I'm secure because I'm on the back end you know, giving AI the source code for it. But 
those jobs can go away like over and like so you have to have constantly stay on trend mm-hmm. stay knowing what's going don't get comfortable it's really that's really the advice to anybody don't get comfortable and 2024 is really showing why you can't get comfortable in any role why you can't get comfortable in any company is because things are changing and if you don't get with the times like you're you're going to le- get left behind yeah i think well a lot of this i still think there was a bunch of like over hiring that some of those companies did Absolutely. for sure but even like we spoke about with scrum masters but like before the pandemic how many scrum masters <laughs> were were you seeing probably before? more yeah and now, like I said, they're they're trying to, you know, get more agile. So with agile, even though with the agile methodology, a scrum master is called out, but they're like, hey, I'm paying this product owner two hundred thousand dollars. You can do both roles. I'm paying this PM one fifty. You can do both roles. And with mm-hmm. AI, um, and honestly, my network engineers, security engineers, you know how to work by yourself. You know how to handle a situation. Document. Yeah. So if you do your part, do a little bit extra, you know, document as you continue to keep going, document your lessons learned, pass it over to the PM. We'll have that information. And so it's like those scrum masters, those, though I, I seen um, somebody on YouTube, he talked about it, that hyper specification and that's what kind of what scrum masters are it's this hyper specification in agile versus like the overall um you know process of it that that leaves people out so it's like okay are you good at cybersecurity? are you good at one component in cybersecurity? Yeah. are you good at networking like so it's like you you have to have um you have to balance between having a general knowledge of something and being hyper specific and i think these what the companies were doing it was this hyper you know, hyper specified roles and they're looking and they're like, hold up, I don't, we don't need this. And I really feel like some of these companies took these PPP loans and they, they trying to pay the, the loans back. Probably. I mean, <laughs> that's a hot take. I got some other hot takes that I'll probably share on another episode, but do you got any other hot takes you want to get off, off um, your chest? Any other hot takes? Really? I think the biggest thing is just like, if you're coming to anyone saying breaking the tech and you want to be a PM, Please. <laughs> so this what this all. Let me rephrase this. Mm-hmm. This will probably be the last question. Uh-huh. Well, not last question, but last question really for you. If someone wants to be a technical program manager, what should they do? In your opinion, mm-hmm. I think for in my opinion, there's two things. Definitely, um, if you're transferring from any other role that's outside of tech, really understand what your transferable skills are. That's the the basis of being a PM is understanding what are those things, those leadership um, qualities about you, um, your strategic qualities about you, really understanding do you know how to lead people without managing them. Because uh, being a PM, based on how your company's matrix is, whether your company, your resources are under you as a leader on a project or are they working for other teams? And usually they're working for other teams. So how do you influence it? those people that are working for other teams because they have other, you know, other things that they're working on. How do you get them to do their, their work for you? So really understanding what transferable skills, but on the technical side, really understand where you want to work at. Like what, what things do you want to work out? The trends that are going on right now, data warehousing, AI and machine learning, cloud computing, find one of those and, and it can be any interest point because like I just mentioned, those are trends and they're highly, um, sought after in these different companies go in and find out hey what are these are there any boot camps I know people hate boot camps <laughs> but it helps to, to give you the knowledge as a PM so like if there is there any boot camps or are there any certifications that that on a technical side that you can learn you know I looking at like solution architects those those certifications that they have really going and finding a domain that works for you and that you really want to get in and and set in that domain and and drill in learn a a lot about that and focus on that and getting the job in that because if you spread yourself too thin you're you're just not going to find anything so really just zero in in finding hey i like cybersecurity. let me go find a boot camp that fights that and then work on that while you're also finding and improving in transferable skills going and um seeking out if there are any projects 
um, in the community that you can work in. Um, like you mentioned that, you know, doing this podcast and doing other things with your business, you learned a lot of transferable skills. And it's the same thing in, in your community. Are, are you part of a church? Are you part of a sorority or fraternity? Are you part of any of these organizations that a project needs to be managed and manage a project? Find something that you can manage a project because there are, you, you know, there's a, a way to manage a project everywhere. So really learn that. But really from a technical aspect, find a domain that you really want to learn about and really drill in and, and understanding that. And um, another aspect I would say is go to these job postings and look at the skills that they're looking for. If it's, it's, it's telling you exactly, they're giving you the cheat code of what they're looking for in jobs and really go down there and look at what the skills that they're looking for outside of just PM roles. Cause people look at PM roles and they're like, okay, I have the project management experience. Okay. But what about the other things that they're telling you that you're going to do on the job? What are you focusing on that? Focus on that. And I feel like people, um, that strategic um, goal will help them get a lot further. Great, great. And then this is the last actually question. Is there any question that I didn't ask you that you wish I asked you? Um, no, I think we covered it all. I don't. Hmm. I'm going to ask a funny one, though. Um, so I presume that you are single. I am. All right. Fellas, if y'all in the area, because I get a lot of people in Dallas that watch this. And my last guest then found him a little boot from the, off the show. Okay. So, hey, look, <laughs> she says she's single. Y'all y'all come correct. How do they keep in, how do they follow you online? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Terry, T-E-R-R-I, Evans, E-V-A-N-S. So just find me on LinkedIn. I am, I guess my DMs are open on LinkedIn. <laughs> Listen, just connect with her, send her notes, say, hey, I seen you on the podcast, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll go yeah. from there. But uh, I appreciate y'all for tapping in with us. Y'all know what to do. Subscribe to the Patreon. She mentioned boot camps. Check out Level Up in Tech if you want to get into the cloud. You know, the link will be in the description as always. And uh, yeah, you can donate, whatever you want to do. But I appreciate y'all. And until next time, let's stay textual and we out. Peace. Bye.